Well, good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Tuesday of the fourth week of Advent. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, the scriptures we're using tonight are, for the Old Testament, will be in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And we are going to continue with Titus as our New Testament uh, reading. With uh, We'll start chapter 2 there and we'll use Psalm 67. So before we get into the scriptures, though, I'd like us to begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Spirit and the Church cry out. Come, Lord Jesus. All those who await his appearance pray. Come, Lord Jesus. The whole creation pleads. Come, Lord Jesus. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm is number 67. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth her increase. May God, our own God, give us his blessing. May God give us his blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. Let us pray. Father, through your power, the earth has brought forth its noblest fruit, the tree of the cross. Unite all people in its embrace and feed them with its fruit which is everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Our first reading then is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is titled, Hannah's Prayer. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Titus chapter 2. We begin at verse 1. This section is titled, Teach Sound Doctrine. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, let's take a moment and look at these a little more closely. So Hannah's prayer. <clears throat> um, gives <laughs> gives the doctrine of first and second Samuel in themes. We do not prevail through might. And God exercises judgment through the king. God lifts up the humble. God works through the little. Hannah's song is similar to David's song, which is in 2 Samuel, and it parallels Mary's song, which we know as the Magnificat. So she begins with, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. Okay. Um, so she... Oh, she's, I rejoice in your salvation. Um, so she is singing God's praises. And then she breaks into, in verse 3, she changes a little bit. Talk no more so very proudly and let not arrogance come from your mouth. Well, clearly she's no longer talking to God here. Hannah appears, first of all, to be addressing Peninnah, who had previously provoked Hannah for her barrenness. Remember, now let's remember who Hannah is, right? Hannah 
is Samuel's mother, and she has prayed for a baby. And if you, let's see. So if you read chapter one, which yesterday we were in a different book altogether, but um, she prayed and she had been barren. And then she asked God for this gift and immediately she gives him to the Lord. As soon as, um, let's see. Wait until you have weaned him, only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she'd weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull and an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And she gave him to Eli, right? That, that was chap the end of chapter one. As long as he lives, he has lent to the Lord. That's the last thing she said in chapter one. So now she's scolding the woman who... Uh, belittled her for being barren, for being childless. Hannah's song also speaks to those who take pride in their own strength and mocks those whom God has chosen in their weakness. Right? In other words, she's, her song addresses those kind of folks. Don't let arrogance come from your mouth. The Lord is a God of knowledge. By him, actions are weighed. And this is where in the next couple of verses, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread. Those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. Um, in the sermon I heard when I was in Ohio this week, this is something that now Pastor Schultz talked about, um, how God does things. He turns things upside down, right? Um, that's exactly what Hannah is talking about here. Those who were hungry have ceased to hunger, but those who were full had to go find a job and work for bread. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn, right? So everything is turned upside down. And then we, then we get into verse six. And verse six takes a different turn here. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. Sheol is the land of the, 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 the area of the dead, I guess I should say. All right, the Lord wants to save all people, no matter how sinful they are. And Hannah acknowledges that life and death both are in God's hands and that God has the power to humble and to exalt. God can do both. Hannah is saying that. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. And we've seen this in all the lessons in the Old Testament we've read. When the Lord chooses to humble somebody, they are humbled. Um, when Israel turns their backs on God, he, he lifts his protection from them, and they are humbled. And when he decides it's time to reward them, they are rewarded. They are given uh, a life of a, a prosperous life. They, they're, they're granted those things. Look at what he did for Solomon. Solomon became the richest king ever. <laughs> um, all right, and, and he keep, and she keeps going. He makes the poor from the he raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap, to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. So he'll take the poor and raise them to a, a a level of royalty. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Okay. Um. And everything on our planet is in God's hands. Right? How's that song go? He's got the whole world in his hands, right? He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. That's the theme here. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Remember, um, remember Gideon? Gideon was commanded to go and fight the enemy's army and God kept paring his forces down until he had only 300 men to go up against thousands of enemies. And Gideon and his 300 totally devastate them. Right? All right. Um, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Okay, here we go. At the time, there was no king in Israel. Here, at this point, okay? 
Hannah's word prophesies the time when God would give his righteous judgments through his anointed king. And this was fulfilled imperfectly in the earthly kings of Israel, Saul, David, Solomon, etc., etc., right? All the way down. They were imperfect. Even the best ones were still sinful. But this was fulfilled perfectly in Christ, who is his anointed says here this is the first reference in the old testament to the anointed right he will exalt the power of his anointed all right so hannah exalts that god has fulfilled his word her prayer stands as a warning to us when we're tempted to trust in our own strength or our own beauty or our own wealth or our own intelligence her prayer also gives us encouragement to look to god for every good thing that we need in life confident that he will fulfill our deepest desires in eternity through his anointed one, Jesus Christ. That's the promise. That's what the incarnation is about. That's what we will celebrate at Christmas. <coughs> All right, now Titus. Titus has a whole different focus, right? This is, this is a letter from Paul. Um, There are some, yeah, there, this is, um, it's a model of Christian doctrine. Um, it, it's, this is, this is a way that, that Paul describes everything that is necessary for a Christian to know and how you are to live as a Christian. So chapter one teaches what kind of man a bishop or a pastor should be. Okay. In chapter two, he teaches different people in different places in life, the older, the younger, wives, husbands, masters, slaves, how they're to act, right, in each of those roles. And that's what today is about. So chapter one, which if you did the reading yesterday, you would, you would have read that, was about what a pastor is supposed to be. And then he turns and he says, as for you, teach, in other words, teach the flock, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Okay. Well, what's sound doctrine? In contrast to the impure and fractured doctrines of the circumcision party, those who insist that you must be a Jew to be a Christian, right? They, they had to be, there were those who said you've got to be circumcised first and take part in the Abrahamic covenant before you can follow Christ, which Paul has already shot holes in all that. Those were some of the false teachers and there were other false teachers that were, that were troubling this community. So <clears throat> he is saying, Titus has to teach these, these folks the whole trustworthy word in accord with the teaching of Christ and his apostles, All right? This is, you know, Paul saying, you know, you've been taught the true word, stick to the true word, don't deviate from it. If what you hear is not what we taught you, then it's not the true word. So he's, telling him stand up against that so so first he goes to older men sober-minded dignified self-controlled sound in faith love and steadfastness there's a whole lot there right um and that's a pretty high bar right first sober-minded that's fair you know it's one thing to enjoy a drink here and there it's something else to Drink to excess repeatedly. Not a good thing. Self-controlled. Dignified. Hmm. Could we use a little more of that in our society today? Sound in faith. Well, guess what? Sound in faith. Um, if you walk a journey of faith through your life as a younger adult... When you are a senior adult, you will have matured and you will be able to mentor those younger than you. This is, this is a role that the older men in any church community can fill, regardless of their physical well-being. Sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. Well, what's steadfastness? Consistency, right? Consistency. Um, 
being reliable, knowing people should know, oh, that's, uh, what's a good name that doesn't apply to anybody personally? Let's pick a, that's, that's uh, Jacob. Jacob is, that's, he, he, we can count on him. You know, we know that this is how he's going to, he's going to get that done and he's going to do it right. And he'll, he'll take that task and he'll do it, you know, that kind of thing. And we have those in our community, don't we? We have those. Older women are not left out of this discussion either. They are to be reverent in behavior. Well, how's that different from self-controlled and sound in faith? It's a different way of putting it. Reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to much wine. Right? Sober-minded. They're to teach what is good and train the young women to love their husbands and children. That's not a bad thing. To be self-controlled. Yeah, I think self-controlled was for the older men, too. Pure. Working at home. Kind, submissive to their own husbands. Now, that might sound a little bit hard to hear and in... in uh, the age of equal rights, but this was the biblical model. If you read others of Paul's writings, it talks about how the husband and the wife complement each other. Submissive should not be taken in a bad way. It should be honoring, honoring the husband as the head of the household for the role that the head of the household is given. You have to read all of that together, okay? that the word of God may not be reviled. This, these were God's commands. This is how God wanted the family, the household to be established. And when it's done in, in godly fashion, it works very well and blessings abound. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Might be a bit harder for somebody who's younger. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. He doesn't call the older men to good works. He calls the younger men to good works, right? And in your teaching, pastor, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Yeah. The pastor has much responsibility. So that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. Because we know the enemy will do that. They'll take anything you say and twist it and use it against you. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. Okay, once again, I will say this every time we run across this word. A slave in ancient Judea, in ancient Judah, first century Israel, was not the same thing as the African slaves of 19th century America. It was very, very different. Yes, it was still one human being owning another. Yes, it's wrong. But this was part of their economic system. They could work their way to freedom. It was a, a way to pay off debt. So, you know, it was a punishment for something. But it was recognized and there was a period of you worked it and then you were free. It was not, um, it was not like what we had in the, in the time that, that led to our civil war in, the, in our country here. It, it's almost more like an indentured servant. That might be a better comparison. But they're to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering or stealing, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Well, why would a slave do that? Because we're called to count our blessings. If you have debt, do you not have to work? Do you not have to have a job? What would happen if you have a mortgage and car payments and credit card debt and all these things and you just quit working? What would happen? The bank would come, you would be evicted, you would lose your house, you would lose your vehicles, you would lose your possessions. It's not totally unlike where we are today. If you have debt, you are a slave to the person or entity to whom you owe that money. You have to work to pay that off. We don't think of it in those terms, but we can choose to be miserable. We can choose to count our blessings. 
we can choose to be thankful. We can choose to look to God and say, you know, God, thank you that I do have a roof over my head and a, a steady job and the ability to put food on the table and, you know, buy gifts for my family at Christmas time and do those things. We can be well pleasing. We can be positive. We can. These are the kind of things that, that we are called to do as Christians. This is how we are called to act. And it starts at our baptism. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When someone knows you're a Christian, if you've got one of these hanging around your neck, outside of your shirt or your blouse or your dress, you think people know you're a Christian? Do you think that your behavior reflects this cross? Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven? Yeah. Yeah. If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence against you to convict you? To convict you? These are the things that we are called to act out in our daily lives of faith. All right. That's a good place to stop. We continue with our Vespers liturgy. <clears throat> Fear not, Mary. You have found favor with the Lord. Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Hallelujah. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Bishop Dan and Dean Nathan, for Pastor Nelson, for your servant, for all of our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. And that, brothers and sisters, concludes our Vespers for this evening. Thank you for joining me for this time in the word and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, I think right now we will have matins tomorrow um, unless something changes so I hope you can join me for that and until we can be together again whenever that is may God bless and keep you.